Uh, one of the themes of your, of your new book, uh, The Founder's Key, which is uh, not only a, a beautifully written book, but a very uh, 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 important book, I think, certainly one that, could, should, that every citizen might usefully read, and a lot of uh, students, too. Thank you, Charles. Um, is that uh, founded on these self-evident truths, um, America has, in a way, risen to the, uh, to the level of being the, something like a best regime or the best regime, the best form of human government, which seems to be saying an awful lot. <laughs> uh, that's, that seems excessive. Are you, are you serious about that? What, what does that mean? Uh, well, uh, there are two alternative eras in politics, you could say. And in the classical world, uh, they conceive politics a little differently than we do, mm -hmm. more comprehensively, um, but with plenty of caveats like that philosophic friendship we talked about earlier. In the modern world, we have universal monotheism, and so you're going to have to have limited government. You just must, and that's because people in more than one country are going to be uh, worshiping the same God, and yet the law is still going to have a monopoly on force. How do you reconcile those things? The answer is you're going to create a regime in which religion is free and the moral code is derived from some combination of religion and reason. Mm -hmm as in the laws of nature and of nature's God. Well, that solution was taken to its ultimate perfection in the, in the making of America. And then they added to that a form of constitutionalism, which is, I think, like the achievement of the Romans over the Greeks. I think they figured out a way to institute the principles into a governing system that would encourage their perpetuation. And that, I think, is built on a picture of the, uh, of the human soul that the founders carried in their mind. They thought they understood what the soul is like and how it operates, and that if you set the circumstances up right, the best would be drawn out of it. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's not a passive thing. We, we think too much today of the Constitution just as a series of restrictions. You know, we, we know that government is bad, and so the Constitution limits mm -hmm. it. It's actually an amazing effort to make a much, much more powerful government than the one that they had. But they want a government that is in the hands of the people. And uh, Madison, especially, who's my favorite of the Federalist authors, takes so, such great pride in the fact that we have based it entirely on public opinion. Public opinion, the people are the sovereign. But the people are human, just like every sovereign, a human. And that means that the people themselves, in the exercise of their sovereignty, must do it through forms that mm -hmm. brings out the best in them. It is our reason alone that must be placed in control of the government. And uh, I should say, as I talk about that, that uh, many of the things I know about the Federalist Papers I got, on from, got into from your writing about it a long time ago, uh, you know, when you first started, and Lord, that was a long time ago. Uh, so, but those things seem to me to right be... Right back at you. Yeah, right back at you, yeah. Those things seem to me to be uh, beautiful things, and that twin achievement that is really part of a single achievement of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, I think rivals the greatest of the classical world. Mm -hmm. Now, how well, do, uh, how well does this understanding of America, which you uh, have um, outlined here and which you argue at length for in your book, how well is that understood by contemporary conservatism? Uh, poorly. For example, um, you go out of your way uh, echoing or building on the remarks you made here about the Constitution being a strengthening of national government, not a relaxation. Uh, but you go out of your way to argue that, um, that the founders didn't view government as an evil or as something that had to be uh, uh, you know, uh, used only for negative purposes, uh, to prevent tyranny being the best thing the government could do. And a lot of libertarian conservatives, for example, and really a lot of traditionalist conservatives, too, would, would I think, part company with you on that. Yeah, sure they do. And, and, uh, and you know, the, the political nature of man, according to the classics, is written in the faculty that makes man what he is, the beast with reason. And that makes us able to talk. Reason and speech are the same thing. 
And the faculty by which we become able to use, this is Harry Jaffer, the faculty by which we become able to use common nouns lets us see in the good, the good in things. Mm -hmm. if, if there's a glass on the table, if there were three kinds, we'd call them all glass because they have some of the good of the glass in them. It's Aristotle's argument. And that means that we're moral in our central faculty and we share it more gregarious than horses and bees, says Aristotle. So we're together and we have these concerns about justice and injustice. That makes us naturally political. Mm -hmm. The founders understand that explicitly in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, just so we're moral because the good, to be a good human being, is not simply a, a physical or intellectual category. That's right. But it's also a, a state of soul, as you say. That's in, right. In a moral sense. And, and, and to be a good anything is how you recognize what that thing is. But, that, but can government make people good? I mean, that, I think a libertarian would, would certainly doubt that. Uh, and the founders were worried about uh, sure. bad government. That's well. right. That's right. And so government, you know, is a very powerful force. Uh, Aristotle says that uh, uh, a bad man is much worse than a thousand evil beasts. Um, so, yeah, of course it. it but but if you restrain a person from murder, that makes them better. Mm -hmm. But a second thing, if you set up a political system in which it's necessary for the people to talk before they act, for example, by having staggered elections and, and having a purely representative system. Uh, uh, or even separation of powers. All yeah. that. In other words, you are introducing into the political system processes to which people come attached that teach them self-restraint, which is a virtue. And also, by the way, a liberal society, a constitutional society, that places many governing things, especially at the local level, in the hands of local people. And they get to practice governing themselves and others, and it places them in responsibility for their communities, and it builds philanthropy in them. Of course, good government makes people better. But um, uh, uh, many, many uh, of uh, uh, our conservative friends, uh, for example, these days are protesting the election of Barack Obama by signing secession mm -hmm. petitions. Um, is, there, is there a difference between the, the, the right of revolution that the founders appealed to in the Declaration of Independence and the right of secession? Even though the, the current secessionist petitions are a kind of um, bad joke because you don't petition to secede if you, if you have a right if you have a right to secede it's got to be in your own hands yeah. you can't you can't ask someone to let you secede and have such a right but still what there's some intellectual problem there yeah well the uh, secession is claimed to be a constitutional right claimed mainly by people who fancy themselves strict constructionist the trouble is the constitution doesn't say that um, and there's, you know, a long, tangled history about that, but you would certainly not call that an explicit right in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, the right of revolution is a natural right. And in, in the, the great case of secession, one reason why the Confederacy didn't appeal to that right is that their slaves might be listening. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 the right of revolution is grounded in a nature that's beyond any will of ours. And it's for sure, by the way, if the government of the United States becomes despotic, we have a right to revolt against it. Mm -hmm. And we should remember that right as we work on keeping it being from despotic. And, and do we have a right to revolt if the government makes bad people instead of good people around us? Uh, well, it, it, the, the government has to violate our rights. Mm -hmm. And in the violation of our rights, it, it will make bad people. I mean... I had dinner one time with the uh, vice president of Nicaragua back in the day after the Sandinistas were thrown out. Mm -hmm. I guess they're back now. And uh, I, I said to him, I said, how are things in Nicaragua? And he said, they're not very good. And I said, why? And he said, uh, well, we have a lot of problems with our people. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, they lie and they throw away their money. I said, goodness, why do they do that? And he said, because They've been living under a government so long that if you save, it will steal it. And if you tell the truth, you'll be punished. 
that's not good for people to no, live under a rule like that. One of the biggest problems of contemporary governments, which means contemporary democracies, is corruption. I mean, this sort of all-purpose word we use to describe vicious behavior, side deals and so forth of one kind or another, and corruption seems to be correlated with the government, bad government, but also big government. Big government. And see, big government, what, what, what big means here is the government ignores the limits in the law between the public and the private. And our system of government is really remarkable because it's and very different from anything in the classical world because it understands there to be this private sphere in which political sovereignty is located. And that's outside the government. Right. And the balance is delicate because if the government gets really big, it becomes a major force in the process of choosing the right. government in elections. And so then it could seal itself off from control of the private right. sphere. It doesn't protect it, it invades it. And that breeds dependence, which is a growing problem in America, and it breeds corruption in the government because there aren't limits on what they can do. And the separation of powers and therefore the checks and balances break down on what they can do. We were talking earlier, there's a fight going on right now about the fiscal cliff. And it doesn't occur to anybody that what you do about that is that each house should pass a bill and then they have a conference and decide and, and <laughs> meld them together, yes. right? And that's the age-old process. Instead, it's conducted in the pages of the New York Times and on CNN. The, uh, uh, Boehner's got to release a statement toward Obama and then they got to have a conversation. And in private negotiations. Yeah, and right. it's not. So what about the constitutional process? Why don't we resolve it that way? The people elected a house controlled by one party and a, and a Senate by the other and a president of the other. This is the process for resolving that. Why, did, why wouldn't the Speaker of the House, for example, just say out loud, we're going to pass our bill and wait for theirs. And when theirs comes, we'll have a conference committee.